Um, so firstly, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm originally from London, but I lived in Australia for a very long time and now live in Berlin. I've been a musician, developer, and now I work in developer relations, which sort of is a nice mixture of my skills. And you can always feel free to tweet at me. I just won't answer it for about 40 minutes, if that's okay. But, um, so, this is sort of meant as an introductory talk. Um, I'm going to cover, it's kind of a talk I wrote for me six months ago when I didn't really know anything about the company I was then working for. So it's introducing some principles, some whys, some hows, and then looking at some uh, examples and hopefully some live demos if the internet connection lets me, but we'll see. So the first sort of uh, starting point, um, for not, I, I, I don't know, I, th I get the feeling that the audience here is maybe some people have already gone down this path, some people are sort of maybe still more, um, maybe still, oops, that's the wrong button, <laughs> still more with this sort of setup. And so a single uh, instance of a database is fine to a point, but there comes a point where it starts to not be enough anymore. And this is especially true with uh, modern web applications, which are all about processing a lot of data all the time, doing things with it all the time, and having one place where it's all stored is not really viable anymore. It's not really reliable enough. It can't change enough. Um, and you start to reach the limits of some of the traditional databases. And so the future for a lot of people um, is now moving on to uh, distributed. So traditionally, we would start something like this. Let's take the story of a startup. You maybe have a small technology team or people who know a little bit about technology. So you start simply with something like MySQL, which is a very good place to usually start. It's very easy to get started. Then your requirements grow, you're doing well, this is great. Uh, and you need to store some other sorts of data. So maybe you look at things like document storage, which, um, so whilst relational databases will store things in rows of tables with columns in those rows, um, document databases instead store things as files, pretty much, with key value pairs. It's a different way of storing things that lets you be more flexible. So you've added some document storage on top of your relational database so you have a bit of flexibility. Then you need to be able to search everything. So you add some search options. Then maybe you're dealing with media or images or something like that and you want to store blobs, binary objects. And it all starts to get very complicated. And in reality, okay, we know that keeping all this information in synchronization, keeping all this information uh, replicated and reliable is not impossible, but it is difficult, and you could spend a lot of time trying to do this instead of focusing on creating a good application. Um, and one of the one of the methods for trying this, and I wouldn't, as this is an introductory talk, I'm actually going to very quickly explain what sharding is. It's a way of. Uh, it's going to get. There's two different ways we have. Um, Two way, it's a way of breaking up big sets of data into more manageable chunks. Uh, and there's two, two methods. One is horizontaling, horizontal partitioning, sorry, which is also sharding, which um, is dividing the data into different tables, maybe based on something like a date or an area or something like that. Uh, and then we also have vertical partitioning, which we won't cover cover too much, which is actually about splitting the columns across tables. So these are some of the methods we start to employ in um, these setups to make things more manageable. And it's, it's a fairly common practice. Um, but I guess the new wave of distributed databases, uh, and I use new loosely, because some are not that new, starts to try to make this process a bit simpler and make this uh, scaling process simpler. That's kind of where the, the birth comes from. Um, 
And I kind of realized these slides are maybe slightly out of order. We'll, cut, we'll, we'll just go, we'll just move on. Um, and now, I'm always, I've been at a lot of conferences the past few weeks and I have now started uh, Tech Talk Bingo because there's buzzwords that keep coming up and I'm going to use one of them myself, so <laughs> feel free to uh, criticize me for doing so. But we now have things like containers and microservices or compute services, something like Apache Lambda where instead of having one long running application um, that we may or may not increase the number of running applications we have when we need to. We can have little discrete um, containerized applications or application services that we bring up as and when we need them, take them away as and when we need them, and this is becoming a very popular way of working. And keeping data in that sort of setup consistent and persistent, so reliable in terms of its content and availability, is another challenge on top of um, some of the other challenges. And so again, distributed databases sort of aim to make this process easier as well. And we'll look at some of the techniques. So we're going to have a look at some choices, some of the common choices. Um, my particular selection criteria for putting together this list is I have always worked in open source and always will, as far as I know. Uh, so I have only included options that are ones you can install yourself. No software as a service options. And there are lots of those. Uh, I also leave them out because it's very hard to know how they do things as well. So it's hard to really talk about them very much. Um, because a lot of these distributed databases, there's actually quite a lot of space and seats over here if anyone wants to move across. No? Okay, all right. In case you need to run away. I understand, it's all right. Um, because a lot of them are, are aimed at uh, large data sets and regularly accessed data sets, they all claim scalability. There would be no point having a distributed database that wasn't scalable. So they all claim scalability. They all claim data, set, data center replication, i.e. being able to keep data sets copied and in synchronization across data centers, across global locations, and things like that. So I won't really bother comparing whether they do that or not. And all of them are NoSQL based. This is the document type storage that we briefly touched on. They all work in that sort of principle now. Um, and because of this, they involve learning some new paradigms and new ways of coding and structuring your application. And we're going to look at briefly some of those. So some of the initial principles, this is a very empty slide, because, <laughs> because really, initially, some of the principles are quite simple. Generally, the focus is put on the application. Um, and by this, I mean that often the, what gives these systems the performance is that they pass a lot of the responsibility for functionality and accessing functionality to you. Um, and this may be an initial learning curve. But it also gives you that control. So if you want to be able to control things like um, how the setup works and some of the options we're going to look at later, generally it's up to you to code that into your application. And um, some will make this easier and harder, but the focus is generally put on the application. And the other is all, all of them will handle availability of data in terms of the speed of access and um, the speed of access and the consistency of the data in different ways. The consistency is um, when we have a distributed data set and data is becoming is split around it. How much can we rely on um, what is available? And we'll look at we'll actually look at a demo very soon that will probably make that somewhat clearer. But they work with this in different ways. And as we get to the different points, I'll sort of explain it a bit more. So traditionally, this is a kind of setup you would look at. Um, so say this was MySQL. You would have something that is considered a master, something that is in a reliable location, is a more high-spec machine, maybe, or a virtual machine. You, we have slaves, which are copies or partitions of the master, maybe. Um, and everything 
comes through application servers from a load balancer sort of deciding where we will pull this data from. And as we want to scale it, we maybe add some more masters, we maybe add some more slaves, and we kind of come back to some of the issues we looked at earlier. Horizontal scaling is a little different. Um, so generally, each instance can sort of operate on its own in some ways and has the same potential and the same uh, power as every other instance of the database to work together and discover each other and um, share data amongst themselves. So if we want to have a fourth instance, we just add a fourth instance. And um, we now have four instances of the database to handle more traffic. And I think this will all be a lot clearer with a demo if it's not quite clear yet. Uh, in Crate's example, this is sort of what each instance can do. Things like um, transporting the uh, data between instances, how to access an instance through HTTP, parsing queries, analyzing queries, distributing queries, et cetera, et cetera. So each instance can kind of do the same things if need be. Um, so I think I will jump into a demo to demonstrate this and see if it's going to work. And the resolution has changed again, but that's OK. I'm in the telecom room. Here's our telecom widget. <laughs> they didn't pay me for that. That just happens to be there. Um, so let's see if this works. Hopefully. Let's do a quick refresh. Looks OK. It's not going to be the fastest thing in the world, but we should still be able to at least get an idea of what's going on. And also just check that this is still working. Maybe not. I have a plan B if this doesn't work, but it would be good if it does. I think we may have to go to plan B. Yeah. No, OK. I might use this just to talk about some of the other aspects here, though, and we'll see what happens whilst I'm talking. Um, so this, this is a, uh, maybe it's coming together. This is an example from the Crate dashboard, but other, a lot of these databases have similar principles. I will, of course, use what we have to demonstrate, but a lot of the principles are similar. So here we have a 16-node cluster. Um, and at the moment, we can see that data is 100% replicated and 100% available. And I don't think it's going to respond, but if I, no. if I click down here, we could also just look at each individual machine. Uh, sorry, each individual, um, as you know, this in, case, in this case, it is a machine, but, um, or instance, if it's virtual machines. And we could see the load across each individual one as well. Then what would happen <laughs> in an ideal world, I would go into the AWS uh, console, restart one of the nodes. And this number would drop to 15. The health would change, probably to critical initially. And this would change and say the replicated data is now maybe 90% something like that. And if we then jumped into the table structure here, we could actually go and see which, ta which partitions on which instances are most lacking. So, um, and through code methods, uh, which we'll touch on very briefly in a minute, we could say, OK, well, if, um, if data isn't consistent enough, we don't want to do anything quite yet. We'll wait for it to become more consistent again, or we'll look elsewhere in the cluster to find a place where the data is available. And eventually, and in this example, this is using uh, GitHub archive data. Um, eventually, probably in a matter of minutes on a good connection and in a good infrastructure, this would be re-replicated. <laughs> yeah, this, that's way too slow for a demo, so I'll just leave it as that. But eventually, the um, replicated status would come back to 100. Um, and if the 
node that we restarted never became available again, it doesn't really matter because the data has re-replicated across the cluster. If it did become available again, it joins back and we have the data available again anyway. So in either case, it doesn't really matter. Oops. <laughs> Gone to screensaver, OK? OK. So it would have been nice to see that visually, but I hope that made a bit of sense. OK. So an example of, of uh, Crate, this is kind of the various technologies we're relying upon. If anyone wants to talk more about this later, I'm happy to. But uh, the main thing is um, we are using open source components. We are fully open source, et cetera, et cetera. I wouldn't be working for the company if it was anything else. Um, I guess in our case, and um, some others do this, we are storing a lot in Elasticsearch and Lucene, which are two uh, reasonably mature um, storage mechanisms, but we're adding uh, SQL on top. So you, it's stored in a NoSQL way, but you can query with standard SQL. Um, and some others do that, and we're about to sort of get to that point. So these are some other techniques that we may use to check um, our data. As I say, each example we're going to look at handles the consistency of data and the availability of data in different ways. And as I've also said, we will then use the application to figure out what to do. Uh, and we have options such as, and these are more concepts than hard um, variables or settings, we could do something like checking, well, previously we knew that the version of a table or the version of a row in the table was five. Is it now, has it now gone up by one yet, knowing that it's been updated? Or we can even do things like the, a lot of distributed databases will have automatic refresh values on the table, um, which is sort of what handles the automatic um, resynchronization of data across a cluster. But if we want to be kind of especially um, guaranteed that things are consistent, we may manually refresh tables ourselves in code instead. Um, so, yeah, generally, the concepts are reasonably straightforward at a very high level. Um, how they do it, of course, is fairly complicated, but sort of accessing what they do is reasonably straightforward to begin with. So, uh, to make these comparisons, we're going to use GitHub Archive data. This is uh, from the public uh, timeline of GitHub every activity of every hour of every day since 2012. It's a big data set, but it's not actually as big as you may think. Um, GitHub is popular amongst us, but it's not Facebook. It's not used by everybody. It actually, I think, in the data set that we would have looked at if I could have got the connection to work, I think from 2014, 2015, it was about 50 gigabytes, which is big, but it's not crazy big. Um, the data structure is lots and lots and lots of nested objects. So we have something like a repository. A repository has someone who acted upon the repository, who also has their own repositories, and et cetera, et cetera. So the, and the data set changes all the time, depending on the activity they're doing. Um, the, data, the data changes in each row. Even across GitHub's own data, each year they've changed data structures as well. So it's a perfect data set for testing sort of NoSQL um, data sets because one of the positives of NoSQL data sets, databases, is that you can use this sort of data that changes. And the database doesn't really care. Your queries, of course, will have to change if things in the data set change, but the database doesn't really care. Um, it'll just keep storing things. Um, so it's a good one to experiment with. And we're at a developer event, and I think most people love GitHub, so let's put it up there. Uh, this is an exa a very simple example of a row. This is a create event, uh, the person who did it, the repository they did it on, and kind of some metadata about what they did. This is a very simple example, but it's one all the same. Um, so the the very simple query we're going to use to look at how we might issue this query to some of the options is select the user from the data we have available with the most amount of activity on their repos. So let's say, for argument's sake, the most popular user. 
uh, if I could, oh, actually, I'll show you. So this, in standard SQL, would be sort of the query we would use, um, finding the username from the, the actor, giving it an alias, counting the instances, giving it an alias from the table, group by the name, and then order it by the amount of um, uh, the amount. <laughs> um, and even this already, something like a group by, is very common in standard SQL, but in NoSQL world, maybe not so. We'll uh, see. Some offer it, some don't. And interestingly, if I could run this query, uh, the most, uh, the one who gets the most, uh, the highest number is the Google Code cloner, <laughs> which is not terribly. Uh, it's a bit of a disappointment in some respects, because I think it's just an automated system. Um, so. In some respects, this is a simple query, but in other respects, it's slightly unfair because we have something like this group by that is not always represented in NoSQL. But we'll see if we can replicate it. And I may not have always picked the best ways, but it was just to give a point of comparison. So the first option we'll look at is MongoDB. This is um, not that new. Uh, probably one of the more popular options in the kind of NoSQL distributed space. Um, it, so what this consistency means is that on the, the instance that you um, nominate as kind of being a sort of a master or a sort of the most reliable instance um, is strongly consistent and it's eventual everywhere else in, across the cluster. This is not uncommon. It uses its own sort of custom query language and um, everyone claims big name clients. If we wanted to add things like binary storage and uh, full text search, like very complex kind of analysis type search, then we would have to add some extra things to it, but we have some options. So the query is something like this. I'm no expert in Mongo, so this is my sort of first just try at it to see if I could replicate it. It uses this slightly different syntax, which initially looks really odd, but actually is not too hard to understand. Um, this is kind of our table, if we like. Um, we pick the fields we want to return, just one in this case. We group it by a unique um, key as the username, and we total. This is the sort of the count um, equivalent. We sort it by descending, so from highest to lowest, and just limit it to 10. Actually, once you look at it, it's not too, too hard to understand. But if you have applications that are using SQL, then moving to something like this is a complete sort of change. Um, Cassandra is an Apache project. So in terms of kind of open source long longevity means it has a pretty reliable future. Uh, I put a question mark next to the consistency because I found it hard to get a complete and solid answer, which probably means you can make it whatever you need. <laughs> um, it uses what is referred to as a custom query language, but it's actually very similar to SQL, as we'll see in a minute, and sort of pretty similar to Mongo in some of the other examples. So the query is pretty similar. Um, one of the differences is, is instead of a database, it kind of has this concept of a key space instead. And there is no group by, which in this query probably doesn't matter too much. But um, if it was important to you, then we have to look, look at some other ideas. Next is um, React. React is a strange one um, in that it assumes, I think, fairly advanced users, which is not really that unusual in this space. Uh, and I found it extremely hard to find, to understand it in the slightest. The documentation is quite hard to read. Um, and it gives you lots and lots of options. I think this is where they're sort of going. Um, so again, yeah, you can decide how you want to do things. It uses Lucene query language um, for querying and some other concepts, which we will come to very soon. and Again, open source, premium, um, 
blob storage is available, but I think in their kind of paid for model and fully searchable, but pretty hard to get started with. So how do we recreate that query in something like React? And this introduces some um, new concepts. Um, one which I'm still undecided whether I like or not, one option that React lets you do is instead of creating like a schema um, for your data, we can actually use the models of our application code if we were using like a models views controller type application, which we probably would be um, at this sort of level. And we can actually map, uh, say, a, an active record model with its defined fields and relationships sort of directly into the database, which in some respects is quite tidy. Um, but it does involve you um, doing that if you want to. And there were other ways you could do, but I sort of threw this in because it was an interesting idea. Uh, and the query, in inverted commas, is MapReduce, which we will take a diversion to explain that. This is kind of the area of Berlin we're in, sort of down here somewhere. For some reason, it seemed the obvious thing to put in the thumb tank saying it had map in the word. <laughs> it's got absolutely nothing to do with it. But um, So what is MapReduce? It's a very common concept and sort of programming model in uh, large data sets, and especially in these sort of distributed algorithms and distributed processing across clusters. And what does it mean? It's mainly, uh, so you don't really write queries per se, you're mainly actually sort of writing functions instead. So in some respects for developers who aren't like data experts, it's in some respects more attractive. So you get to sort of work in your field as opposed to a kind of data scientist field. Um, the, so what, it, what happens is the map function, the first function, takes the series of key value pairs, processes them based on the logic you've used, and generates uh, zero or more outputs. And it's likely they're going to be different from the ones that went in, but not always. For example, in our particular query, we're actually taking everybody and pretty much just sort of putting them back out the other side again. We're not really doing anything. We're not filtering them in any way. Um, and then the reduce function is called for every unique key in the, in the, the output from the map function. Uh, processing the values associated with the key and then giving outputs again. So in the popularity count example, it would take the values, summing them, and would probably output just uh, a single row for each of the unique keys, so each user, and then a total number for each one. So that's kind of the concepts and how it's implemented varies, but that's the, the concepts. Um, one other one that works in a similar space, and it gives me an example to show a very simple representation of what we just looked at is Couchbase. Um, again, pretty similar. Um, do quite a good job on the kind of the, the premium end. You probably, if you've ever looked at any kind of database technology online, you probably then get Couchbase ads. They're quite good at that sort of thing, at marketing themselves, but um, it works. So they use MapReduce as well, and, and their default sort of installation, they have uh, an admin interface you can play around with, and you can sort of pick fields and just type live into the map and the reduce um, functions, and it gives you a URL that you can click on, and it shows you the output results. It's a good way of sort of experimenting with um, the concepts to get an idea of them. Um, one of my kind of wild card ones to throw in is CockroachDB. This is made by um, ex-Google staff, which always gets people in Silicon Valley very excited. Um, so they've had a lot of money thrown at them um, and are promising a lot. They're pretty much promising everything that you possibly would want from a distributed database without really giving much detail about what it is. <laughs> so, so it's hard to really get get much information about where they're going yet, but if all is delivered, it could be really interesting. And for a query, they claim that they're going to be fully SQL compatible, so, but I couldn't get any 
any kind of proof of that. And they're in a big hiring cycle at the moment, so I think this will change very, very soon. But when I was putting this presentation together, I couldn't really get any solid answers, so we'll leave it as that for now. And finally, there's us, a little startup in beta, based out of Austria. Um, we've sort of focused on performance, so we are eventually consistent, and we don't support something called transactions. And um, this is not uncommon in this space. Uh, this is a way of making sure that um, data is processed in a particular way, in a particular order. And in a lot of instances, it, doesn't, it isn't always important, but in other use cases, it is important. And at the very end, we'll sort of cover when it may or may not be important to you. But it's a way of keeping things far more fast, but not as reliable, maybe. Um, we are using a subset of SQL, um, fully open source. Uh, and because of the underlying architecture we use, you have blob storage and full text search available to you already. And well, the query that I initially showed was taken from me playing around with Crate anyway, so it's the <laughs> same, same query. OK, so that's a, a trip through various examples. And I'm now going to use what about containers as a good time to hopefully do a proper demo that's going to work, because I'm not so reliant on the internet for it. So um, as I said earlier, the, um, the problem not necessarily the problem, but the extra complexity to overcome with containers is as they come and go, how do you keep um, the data still available? Um, and so I'm going to, okay, I don't think, oh no, it wasn't mirrored. You didn't see what I was just laughing at. So <laughs> it was a bit, uh, oops, there we go. <laughs> that probably won't. Okay. So it's going to be running here in a minute. I'm going to use the, the D word, Docker, because it's just easy to get started. Um, this is Kitematic, which is just a visual way of sort of getting started with on, on a Mac. But I'm going to jump into the command line. I don't know. No, I don't. OK, that's fine. So so this is me getting um, an instance of crate running based on the image that we um, earlier, and I hope it is still there, because otherwise this will fail completely, from the Docker Hub where they store their images. Uh, I'm running it in the background with the D, and um, all sort of services use ports generally, open ports to communicate. And in this case, we're saying we're going to let Docker just handle the allocation of ports for us. Good, OK. That's given us an instance. And if we jump into Kitematic, we'll see with its always amusing auto naming, condescending Feynman, not very nice, that it has started here. These are the ports that Crate likes to use. Uh, 4200 is for accessing the admin interface, which we'll see in a minute. And 4300 is how the um, instances communicate with each other. And we've just let it Docker map it to wherever it wants, basically. But a distributed database would be a bit stupid with just having one. So let's create a few more. And finally, we're going to actually manually set the port mapping to what we want. And because this is on the same machine, this can only be done once, because you can't have duplicate um, port numbers. Oops, no, that's no, not. There we go. So now we have four, and one of them somewhere will be, that's it. That one is not dynamically set. It's the one we asked for. OK. So. So. Great. Four nodes on our local machine. Very interesting because it's got absolutely no data in it, which is a very useful database. Um, some of the things I wasn't able to show before, but are not be very interesting. 
Um, here's the various instances. Great. And this is where I would like to have the internet. Let's see if this works. <laughs> it would be good to have a database with some data in it. <laughs> no. It makes for a very bad database demo if a database has no data in it. <laughs> but I don't think this is going to go anywhere. Everybody get off Twitter so I can import data from Twitter. <laughs> no. Okay. I think I'll just have to talk about it in principle again and um, so generally then what we would do, I'll leave it keep running, maybe something will come and we can do it in a minute with five tweets for a really massive amount of big data there. Um, so one of the things this lets us do is we can very easily in a similar way to the uh, AWS example is destroy, add Docker instances or container instances as we need them. and um, Again, they will resynchronize and synchronize. And this, if everything is in the same machine, uh, and with something like Docker, you could have 50, 100 containers all on the same machine, um, we don't really have to do much more. We can add and remove containers as we need them, and the data will get resynchronized. Um, if we're across different machines, we need to do a couple more things. One, we need to say that on uh, each individual machine, we set a place where the data is stored. And this could also be um, another machine entirely, if we wanted to have somewhere that was backed up every 30 seconds and ultra-reliable and things like that. It lets us, that's the problem with having a web demo, um, it lets us, uh, Forget about it. Don't worry. Um, it lets us uh, set um, a way, a place that when a container is, if there are no containers then running on a machine and then one comes back, there's some data left behind by a previous container that it can then pick up from. So it doesn't start from zero every time. But either way, it doesn't matter too much because there's either some data left on the, the VM or the physical machine or there's some data in the cluster that things will discover each other eventually. And of course, the complexity of your data, the, uh, the speed of network, the machine quality, things like that will affect how long eventually is. But it makes this um, synchronization and easy scaling simpler. I'm not going to be stupid enough to say it's easy. It's not, but it's simpler. Um, because a lot of these distributed databases, I think I'd have to give up on this, oh well. Um, because a lot of these distributed databases uh, use something like a concept of service discovery to find each other, finding their, <laughs> we're gonna use the word friends because it seems the first word that jumps into my mind, um, to keep in synchronization with each other, there needs to be a way of that happening. And on the same machine, that's reasonably easy, but when you're spread across data centers, it's a little bit harder, and there's ways of doing that. There's, um, you can either manually set the IP addresses or the DNS names of each instance in the cluster. That's not terribly dynamic. Uh, but lots of them also offer things like discovery through DNS queries. So if you know that all the instances are going to have the same sort of domain name patterns. Um, or there's something, if you want to get more complicated and you're using containers and other infrastructure, Something like a Apache Mesos or Google's Kubernetes will handle some of this management for you and also let you have a mixture of containers, non-containers, and handle some server discovery for you and kind of let you set policies for when things will scale up and down. So you can sort of start simply and get complicated very quickly, but um, uh, I, I would probably assume that once you're at that kind of level where you're needing those things, you know exactly what you're doing to a point. So, but there's some of the options available. So let's finish up with what I alluded to earlier. Where will some of these databases be appropriate and where not? Um, the not well suited is small, but quite a big one. 
as I said, the, not all of them require, not all of them have transactional consistency, and this is very important for things like financial records. We kind of need things to work in a particular order, um, as for example. So it's probably not your best uh, use case. Strong relational data. If you've come from a SQL world where you're used to things like joins or grouping by data to get, it's like being at the um, wrestling or boxing, I think. <laughs> um, the, uh, to get complicated queries, not all of them will support this. In our particular case, we're working on joins, which is what everyone in distributed databases says, because it's bloody hard. <laughs> so, so um, but some do and some don't. What it is well suited to is semi-structured data that changes all the time, databases that are going to be, you probably, hopefully, are going to be changing if you're a startup, for example. Perfect for things like analytics, business intelligence, sensor data, things like that that are just happening all the time and aren't particularly mission critical if it's a few records come out of synchronization or don't, uh, don't make it like, you know, it's, it's, they're perfect for high volume and maybe not 99% important data. And that may sometimes sound like, so you're telling me my data isn't important? Well, it is, but these databases focus on performance and that sometimes is more important to you. Um, and I have just a couple of very quick slides, which I will just very whip, whip through. Um, most of these options offer things like ORM mapping. So if you're use, it's object relational mapping, so again, referring back to the model-based um, uh, frameworks, where you can just map your, using a, an adapter that is relevant, you can map, it'll do the mapping between the model and the database for you. Um, Getting started is usually offered through a variety of infrastructure options. Um, so easy to get started, anyway, and give things a go. Uh, and that's our contact details. Um, I've done a, quite a few talks, and I completely ran out of merchandise. All I have is these tiny little stickers, <laughs> which are very cool. Uh, and if you have a small laptop, they're perfect. <laughs> and there's lots of them down here, so please come and take some after questions, and I apologize that that's all I have left, but <laughs> um, thanks very much, and yes. Questions? Questions. Yes. <laughs> okay, please wait for the mic, because everything is recorded, you need to be on the mic. Uh, Steve, please take care of the of your site. Thank you. Questions? Who has questions? No questions? Everyone's an expert, huh? Yeah. Hi. So I heard reading DB is good, but do you know more? Uh, like it's reading DB. Have you worked with this? Oh. I've it's, heard of it. Yeah. Okay. I think it's a better Mongo, but maybe. I the, don't know. the problem with this space is. It's almost, it's almost up there with JavaScript frameworks. There's a new one all the time. <laughs> it's, it's a fairly busy space, and trying to keep up with all of them is, yeah, there's a lot of them. I just picked, I don't even know what my decision was to pick the ones I picked. I could probably talk endlessly, but that would get very dull. But there are um, plenty of others as well, yeah. Rethink Arango, which is another German startup, which is, is another interesting example as well. Yeah, there's many more. Okay, we have five more minutes. More questions? Uh, switching from something simple, simpler to distributed databases. If we start with something simpler. So, so the question is, if you have something simple, what's the best way to switch to this? Is that right? Yeah. I guess, so this is where especially um, our company has tried to fill a gap, and some of the others do it as well, by having that um, ability to use SQL. So if you have come from MySQL and you want to try one of these sort of databases, it makes it theoretically quite an easy way to move in, unless, unless you're using things like um, 
the best examples I can think of are, are things like uh, lots of um, PHP-based content management systems that use lots of heavy relational data. It's not going to work. I get asked quite a lot, strangely, could I connect WordPress to Crate? And I think, firstly, why is not a lot of point. But secondly, it's probably not going to work because it, I think WordPress has lots of joins and things like that. I would assume it does. Um, so if that isn't important to you, then yeah, go for it because you can generally start with SQL. But if you need to have lots of that relational data, um, then you have to look elsewhere <laughs> at do caching and things like that. But if that isn't important, then it's certainly not that hard to get started, really. OK, Chris over here. Oh. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, what are the consistency guarantees and uh, behavior for create in case of network partitions and split brain scenarios and similar? Um, I heard the first bit and then the last. Uh, consistency guarantees uh, for, for create in case of part uh, network partitions. In case of? Network partitions. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, so I guess the only way I can really answer it, it, you can partition across a cluster split wherever um, and how you partition it. Uh, in another talk, I have a, um, a good example with partitioning schema creation as well. Um, so you can leave it to partition how it wants to, or you can partition it to particular instances if you want to. And then in terms of the consistency, in terms of speed, it's um, quite fast. We have uh, clients using it across data centers around the world, and, and they've managed to, they switched from MySQL, to be fair, but um, the performance has increased in terms of keeping the data consistent across the distributed global cluster. Uh, and they've managed to reduce their infrastructure. They have less machines as well. Um, and in terms of sort of reliability, um, I think the only time we've had a client who's lost data, it was user error, not a technical problem. And you know, to be fair, we're small, so the user base is small. But there's lots of people, there's, there's clients using it for lots of data, and we haven't had any problems yet. And a lot of the underlying Elasticsearch issues, if maybe that's what you're alluding to, we. Um, have worked quite hard with them to um, solve the problems they had in the first place, but also we bypass some of the functionality in Elasticsearch that caused those problems in the first place anyway. So it, the short answer is good. <laughs> but I don't know, does that, does that answer the question? Or?